Well, hello, Cross Line. Good morning. Welcome to 1030 service. We're excited you're here. If you would please stand up with us. We know you woke up bright and early, ready to worship. You had that coffee going at 530 this morning. We're ready too, so hope you're ready to sing with us. Thank you so much for joining. If you're new here, welcome. Let's put our hands together. an awesome God who's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. Let's worship Him together.
got some red hands from all the clapping today.
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He's my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He's my song. And you are good.
Church, can we sing that out one more time? You are good. All the voices in the room, let's sing that out together. You ready? You are good, good. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know, oh, I know he holds the
Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. Uh, as, as we get move into uh, the weekend after Thanksgiving, and it may be that God speaks to your heart or whatever, what was that like the first time you did a sacrificial giving? And what would you say to a new family uh, or a family at Cross the Line Church that's thinking about giving sacrificially this year. Austin, while um, when you told us about this Q and A a while, a couple weeks ago, um, I've been praying about, you know, what to say. It kind of answer this question, mm-hmm. help people along. And for us, sacrificial giving kind of comes down to two things. The first one is, what is God the Lord of? You've talked about. What parts of your life is he the God of? And, you know, a while back, you know, he might, he wasn't the God of our finances. And so like Joshua had to make a decision. You talked about Joshua tonight. We had to make a decision. Is God the God of our finances? And we made the decision, as for me and my house, God is the God of our finances. Yeah. And the second part of that is, um, do, we, do we believe what the Bible says is true? And that, and you look in Luke 638, when Jesus said, given it shall be given unto you, good measure. Do we really believe that to be true? If he's the God of our finances, and I know Mick, Mick Pierce said last, last week that you can't outgive God. That's scriptural. That's in Luke 638. Given it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. And so do we really believe what God's word said is true? And so we made a decision that he's God of our finances, and we made a choice to believe God's word is true, and that when we give, and maybe it's that car we were saving for, and we're going to give part of that to God. And so the, you know, the thought is, can we, will we be able to afford that, afford that car when this one breaks down and we have to replace it? If we believe God's word to be true, he will. He'll take care of us. And he has. And he has. Yeah. Yeah, that theme of, Gary mentioned it, Danny mentioned it. God's always been faithful to us. So we've been in our sermon series, Get Real, uh, and we've been talking a lot about things going on. Last week we talked about, uh, well, last Thursday and Sunday we talked about idolatry, just putting things before God. And one of the things that um, Scripture tells us is that a lot of things are competing for our time, our money, our energy. Basically, they're competing for first place in our life. They're, they're competing to be God. 
And Scripture even tells us that we, we even put ourselves in the place of God. One of the ways to really recognize that in the New Testament church is if you're very excited to tell anybody about Jesus. You know, we talked about our purpose statement. It's to win, train, sin off the Great Commission. When we baptize somebody, how do we do it? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and the reason that that's a Great Commission is Matthew 28, 19. And, and, and so also the purpose of our church, that's the purpose, is to win people to Christ. Train each other up in the Lord. Right? That's why we never stop meeting together. The instruction from the Bible to us is never stop meeting together. And, and so that we spur one another on in growing and really in, in, in kind of a biblical competition, just to keep it at the front of your mind that uh, the time is near and, and, and that uh, when Jesus returns, that's it. It's, uh, there's not five more minutes. There's not 10 more minutes. And so it's supposed to be urgent in the Bible. So our vision for each person in our church is you come in, we want to serve your family, but the, the last part of that is even more important is to grow your ministry. And why would we say that? Because uh, in the New Testament church, if Jesus is first place in your life, if God, if the God of the Bible is first place, you're just going to want to tell people about him. You're going to want to um, win people to Christ. And if you don't want to win people to Christ, it's very clear that something else has first place in your life. It's just that simple. You could read about all the mysteries of God's Word and find out uh, all the nuances of Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and read all the Talmuds and read all uh, of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Maseratic texts and, and the Textus Receptus and all the stuff you, you don't study, but I do, right? But you could read all that. And you're still going to come out with this one simple truth that God wants to be first place in your life. And so th there's, there's a, a few more things to say about that than we could say in one week. And so um, I, I just want to start by saying, well, we have a group called Storytellers. Uh, I've never been to it, uh, but it's on Saturdays and they write stories about them and all kinds of stuff, Okay. One of the ways that that started was uh, we did a sermon series and, and we talked about how each person has a story. Way back when we were in the coffee shop, we were meeting the coffee shop, and 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 I want to start off a little bit with that tonight. I was talking to a group the other day and I was telling them that when you're a Christian, when you're a believer, you have an amazing story. Um, now a lot of times we focus on people who have an amazing worldly story, like the ones that we're interested in reading, maybe somebody overcame de uh, certain death circumstances, or, or somebody has an amazing story about um, their athletic career, somebody has an amazing story about how they overcame odds and made money. But I'm, I just want to tell you that all those stories will last a generation or two, Right? There are athletes uh, that played 60 years ago that, that were fantastic, that overcame incredible odds, uh, that could do amazing things that no teenager today cares about or has ever heard of, right? There are, there are people who, who were the richest people on planet Earth a generation ago, and none of you know their names. There is somebody that overcame certain death 100 years ago, right? They had a story, they had a bestseller, but you don't know who they are. Well, because they, now they're probably dead, right? But, but you don't know who they are. So their, their story is only so good, but the story of a believer is incredible. The reason the story of a believer is incredible is lots of reasons, but um, your story will never be forgotten as a believer. Your story will not, now you're going to say, well, that, not that many people will know about it. Well, they will, because your story is written in God's book of life, that's eternal, and that story will be read uh, for all time. That story will never go away. And because of your story, if you tell your story, here's what's amazing about a, a believer's story. If you're willing, God's word says, if you're willing to tell your story of faith, other people's eternal destiny change because of your story. That's pretty amazing. That's not what I think, that's not my opinion. That's what God's word says. So your story is absolutely so incredible that as a believer, see, people in the world, uh, before Christ, your story can only be so good. 
And actually, most people's story is, is a train wreck. It's actually not even fun to listen to. But in Christ, you're right, and the best story we could have in this church is, is like the little kids that got baptized, that they would always have faith, that they would grow up. Uh, yes, of course, they'll have uh, things that happen to them, but they will grow up always believing in Christ, always living their life in faithfulness as a Christian, and that story is the one that we're after. Sometimes we have a lesser story, like mine. We have a lesser story where, where somebody didn't accept Christ till they were 18, or, or maybe a lesser story where uh, we lived a, a lot of life uh, in our 30s or 40s. Now, that's a great story, and a lot of people relate to it, but it is a lesser story. The stories in our church where people have always believed in Christ is the most incredible, faithful, God-written stories that there are, and they're absolutely incredible. You know, every time that God has a relationship with people in the Bible, the story is incredible. So what, what's interesting is um, we always talk about something, right? And when I say we, I mean our community, the, the people that we're around. We're always saying hi, and we always engage in conversations. Now, if we're going to get real, some of our conversations lately might have a whole lot to do uh, with politics and COVID, maybe more so than Jesus. And, and it's, uh, maybe you're overrun by fear or anger or, or whatever, but, the, but it's all around us. And, and so what I want to show you is what God's Word says about the things that we say. Not only the things that we put as God, but the things that we say. You know, all, like I said, all, uh, every time God is in the story of people, it's, it's an amazing story. In Psalm 105, you don't expect to hear this in the, in the Psalms, but in Psalms 105, 39 through 42, it recaps the most, one of the most incredible stories in human history. It said, he spread a cloud for covering and a fire to give light by night. You know, so here's God. Um, he, he provides a cloud for covering, and in that cloud is a fire above uh, the nation of Israel in the wilderness by night. It's, it's an incredible story. They asked, and he brought quail, and he gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened a rock, and water gushed out, and, and it flowed through the desert like a river. Actually, they they found this rock uh, and all the watermarks from it and everything. It's, a, it's actually incredible in the Middle East. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. You know, the mo here, here's one of the most amazing stories that we've ever heard. It's, it's the story of Exodus. Moses and, and Israel, as they, exit, they, as they exit Egypt, and it's easily one of the most famous stories in human history. It will always be told. Um, it's amazing when that story gets told in the New Testament church, some people come to Christ. It's, it's amazing because it really, it hasn't really talked about Jesus, so we think. But Jesus is in this story. It, it matters what we spend our time talking about. What do you spend your time focusing on and talking about? Well, I guarantee you, as, as we looked at last week, if you spend mo most of your time talking about something, it's probably the thing that you worship the most at the time. And, and believe me, it's a sneaky situation what we start giving our time and our money and our effort to, but it easily things distract us, right? In 1 Corinthians, um, we, we start to learn uh, that the Bible gives us some comparisons. Sometimes the Bible tells us that a word is uh, a metaphor, is an analogy for something else. And we, we get this in, in 1 Corinthians 10.4. It says, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. This is still talking about the Exodus and the nation of Israel, God's people. What did they do? Well, they got the word of God, right? And when they got the word of God, the Bible calls it all the way in the New Testament, a spiritual drink. And actually, uh, we know uh, that there are a lot of comparisons from Jesus in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. Here, he's referred to as the rock, the rock that followed the nation of Israel. It's, it's kind of an incredible story. But one of the things that this is leading up to in, in God's word is 
the world uh, kind of has a war within a war, right? Like there's big wars with guns and bombs and missiles and planes, right? You have that kind of war. But there's also a war that goes on underneath the surface in all our relationships, and it's a war of words. In your personal relationships and uh, your relationships that you just come across kind of surface-like, there's there there can be a war of words, and there is a war of words. If you start reading the Bible, uh, the things that you believe, you're going to start repeating them. They're going to overtake your conversation. And God's Word is described as water sometimes in, in the Bible. And... Um, he uses that on his people, and, the, and when his people use uh, his word, it's called this life-giving water. The problem is uh, there are other people that believe in evil in the Bible and uh, in the world, and, and Satan has words, and they're also sometimes described as water. I'm, I'm going to show you a few of these in, in just a minute. In Revelation 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan, Right? A lot of times in the Bible, it will say the devil and Satan. The devil had an office, and it was the Satan in, in the Old Testament. So that's why it says those, those things. He was the deceiver of the whole world, and he was thrown down to earth, and, and his angels were thrown down with him. In, in Revelation 12, 15, it talks about some of the evil things that he did. And it, it says the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, the woman's uh, Christ in the church, and swept her away with the flood, right? So what, what is, what's he doing? With words, the, the Bible's comparing that to water. So we have, we have physical water that we know about, but in the Bible we have spiritual water. And we see this all through the Psalms. In Psalm 69, 1 through 2, it says, Save me, O God. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink deep in mire. There is no foothold, and I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. In Psalm 69, 15, it says, Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. You know, that, those are the words of the enemy. Those are the negative words that are, that are killing him in this situation, King David. And in Psalm 93, 3, uh, we see God's words. It says, the flood has lifted me up, O Lord. The flood has lifted their voice. The, the floods lift up their roaring. So his enemies and all the, who were against him and Satan, they were, they were waging war with their voice. I mean, I think some of us can relate. I think with the power of social media and the power of words, of uh, people close to us and people that can just heap on. This is the illustration of the Bible. The waters are, are washing over me, and it's a negative, it's a satanic, it's an evil way. But then God has um, his words, and God has something to say about the words of the world. The world is always talking. Remember I said there's, there, in, in the world there is a war of words. And what you speak about matters. In fact, what you speak about as a believer matters so much because there's a, just, a, a, just a, a river, an ocean of satanic words. In fact, through, from our children to the things that we hear, most of the things that we hear in a day may not be from God. In fact, most of your life, most of the words that you may have heard may not be a godly type sentence. It may not be a godly type communication to you. And you might feel overwhelmed with uh, this, this, this kind of communication that the Bible likens to water, and it has the power to kill us. It has the power to overwhelm us and overtake us and, and overwhelm our soul and get us down and, and, and just full of fear. And, and so you see uh, the, the, the writers of the Bible say, God, please keep that at bay. Well, Psalm 93, 4 kind of gives us perspective. It says, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord is on high and he's mighty. So what the Bible says is, listen, most of what you see and, and hear and say in your life can be from, not from God. It, it may be extremely negative. It may want to overtake you. Right now you may be full of fear, anger, whatever. You're fighting a uh, fight on, on both sides. You know, many of the Bible studies we have said People said they were, they felt overwhelmed because no matter what they say, they're going to find themselves in a fight, right? 
They're going to find themselves in a fight. Right now, they can't say anything. If they, don't, if they say this, half the people are fighting with them. If they say this other thing, half the people. Why? Because the times are evil. And the words that the world has for you may feel, but here, here's what God says. He, I'm mightier than that. And the words that God has for you are mightier than that. So, so we know that God can talk. We know that Satan can talk. And here's a problem. You can talk. Right? I mean, we can talk and talk and talk. And, and, and here's the problem. You can drown yourself. With your words and what you talk about all the time, if we're using biblical terms, you're, you're washing waters over your own head. You're bringing that, you're bringing that satanic uh, and, and that sinful thing. We're not talking, I'm not just talking about negative, although negative things uh, are, are from Satan. I'm talking about pure worldly talk. Like, remember what I said? The story of a believer can only be so good because it's temporary. Whatever they built, whatever they did, it's just temporary. For, for somebody that, that's not following God, for somebody that's of the world, their story can only be so good. But the story of a Christian is unbelievable. The water's different. In Proverbs 8, 18, 4, it says, The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Proverbs 6, 2. If you're snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. The Bible has a whole lot to say about the words that come out of our mouth, uh, how they make us feel, how we're going to function from day to day. Are we involved in idolatry, worshiping something besides God? And God speaks words of eternal life, and Satan speaks words of death. That's just it. Like, there is no more complicated thing than that. It's just simple. It's, it's, it's easy. And if you speak the words of God to people, you're bringing life to them. Right, you're bringing eternal life, and if you speak the words of the world, I'm not talking about. Oh, you, you know, I'm not going to say. Well, you don't have to worship Satan. You, you don't have to. You don't have. You can just worship yourself and the stuff that you're working on. Your words bring death to people because your your conversation is always dragging somebody with you to what you're doing. Remember, I talked about um, some so-called uh, popular Christians. In our society, and when they walk away from the gospel because of their sin, sometimes they make a big announcement. Why do they make a big announcement? Because they want people to follow them. Good luck standing in front of God if you're like that. In a lesser way, and, and maybe a way we're not even understanding, we can do the same thing because what do you say to people? What do you say to your children? What do you say to your friends? If everything that you if everything that comes out of your mouth is about your life and the stuff, the temporary things and the things that you're building and it and leaves God's out, your words are like the water that brings death. And the Bible is, warns us against this over and over. And, and really, the Bible also tells us another thing. Out of the abundance of your heart, that's what comes out of your mouth. What do you spend all day doing? Do you spend all day defending yourself? Do you spend all day trying to give people a picture of who you are and what you are? You know, how about this? You could bring the waters of life to somebody if you spend all day talking about your story in God and, and what he's like and his kingdom and the stuff that he builds. In 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 14, it says, And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Listen, people aren't going to understand that talking about God brings life. Not at first. You know, don't, don't be surprised that people that don't know the Lord argue against the Lord. They just do. You know, this probably has never been said better than by Jesus himself in, in, in John chapter 4, 10 through 14. One, you know, the most famous verse in the Bible talking to the Samaritan woman. She says to him, how is it a Jew asks for a drink from me? The whole thing is about physical water, right? A, a woman of Samaria, because Jews don't have dealings with us. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was saying to you, give me a drink, you'd ask him, and he'd give you living water. Remember? 
We're talking about this water. Here it comes up. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's a constant flow through the Bible. He said, you'd ask, and you'd be given living water. And the, and the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. The well's deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than, the, than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never be thirsty again. The water I give him will become a, spr- a spring welling up to eternal life. See, we, we know that there's natural water, but there's spiritual water. And, and God spoke this way, and so we're just, if we're going to get real, we're going to speak the way God speaks. And, and, and God tells us that you have the opportunity to speak life with spiritual water to people. And if you don't, that's because that's what's in your heart already. If you've never shared uh, your faith with, in Christ with somebody, if you've never concerned yourself, there's a couple reasons for that. It may be that the, that the congregation of believers that you are a part of never encouraged it. They never taught you that. But there may be a different reason. It may be that you're involved in idolatry, that you worship the things that you're working on, the things about yourself, the things um, that you want to go after, and they have nothing to do with God, and they're out of place, and that's idolatry. That's cheating on God. In fact, God also compares that with adultery, and, and he will not put up with it in his relationship with his people. The New Testament church is his people, and so what, what are we to do? We're to bring living water his word to people. And, and here's, here's one of the most incredible things that you're going to discover if, if, if you do this. Just a little bit of God's word will overtake an ocean of satanic things. Just a little bit of your story will change the course of someone's drowning life in the world. They might be in the middle of the worst stuff that the world has to offer, liken that to a deep ocean and they got no hope and your story that is incredible in Christ if you share a little bit of that God does a miracle and he makes his water overtake the water of the world his word defeats the words of the world and I just think that we need to concentrate on this in this time what we're going through day after day with with the elections and, and, and with and with COVID and with all the things people were worried about. Listen, what you need to be worried about is what's coming out of your heart? What's coming out of your mouth? What's the overflow of your heart producing in your life? Because if it's the words of the world, that just brings death. But you have an amazing story. You might not think it's amazing, but it is amazing because God says it is. You have a story of redemption and salvation in your life. And when you share that with somebody, you don't need to know all the mysteries of the Bible. All you need to know is that God saved you, that he's growing you, that he's healing you. And when you're willing to tell someone that, he promises to do the miracle and give them the type of living water that they'll accept Christ. And it changes their eternal destiny. I would hope that a message like this would cause us to pause and say, okay, am I putting things before God? Am I worshiping something besides God? And I think that's the purpose that where God said, you know what, you guys get so easily distracted, you need to take communion every time you meet together. To to why? To remember Jesus. Why? Because because we're easily distracted. We get a little nervous or fearful and we start, uh, all our words have to do with something else besides God. That's not the way God's people are supposed to be. And so he says, do this in remembrance of me. Put me first. And so like a lot of weeks, I I would just ask us uh, to do this one thing. Remember tonight, the worship team will do the prayer. So uh, take communion uh, and uh, take it and and go back to your seat and and be reflective. But before you even get up to get communion tonight, if you're going to take it, uh, I, I, will, I want you to sit in your seat and wonder, what, what are the words coming out of your mouth? What's in your heart? Is there something that you're putting before God? The measurement's easy, right? We've talked about it. What do you talk about? What are you concerned about all day? Is it something of the world or is it Christ? Are, are you concerned with sharing your faith and your incredible story with the world? If you're not, the fix is easy. You're just putting something above God. You're making something God that is not God. And God won't put up with it. He demands 
And he says in his word that he's a jealous God. He demands first place in his people's life. Well, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're here tonight, a part of the local church. You're his people. Long ago, it was Israel. That was the only people. Now it's the whole New Testament church. Everybody can accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Tonight, before you go to communion, I would like you to think about what you talk about this week, today. Before you take it, put the Lord back on his throne in your life. Make him number one. And when you leave here, make sure that your priority is to use your mouth to bless somebody else with living water that comes from God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight, your word. We thank you for the incredible things that it says. It has powerful things to tell us about water. Lord, we need water every day. When we're thirsty, we, we ache for it. And Lord, I just, I just pray that tonight we would hear what your word has to say and we'd have a congregation of believers that would leave here and bless the world with your words. That they would knock down the idols in their lives, in our lives, and we'd go out a mighty church that's interested in growing your kingdom and not our own. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Oh
I think we can end on that note. Amen, guys. Hope you had a wonderful worship experience and heard a wonderful message today. Please do take the message and just think about your personal ministry and who you're serving. Are you serving others? Are you serving things of this world? And then invite, invite people to church, encourage them, lift them up, and get them in this building. Have a great week. If this is your very first time here, also we have a gift for you at the back table. So please try to connect with somebody. We want you to know more about us and uh, just let you know how you can get involved.